<laughs> Good morning. <laughs> oh, Danny's up here going, showtime. Oh, oh, excuse me. Showtime. There you go. <laughs> Sounds so different over the microphone. <laughs> Good morning, good morning, good morning. How's everybody doing? Good. We want to welcome our our uh, guests, our friends. We want to welcome our state national friends online. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being here today. God has a word just for you as well as for the rest of us. Amen. And so we want to just always, always acknowledge, first off, when God's presence is in the room. And he's here in this place. Amen. And he does. If you come with expectation, you're going to get something you will. And you will not be disappointed. Now, we're going to be talking about some things we've been talking about. But we're going to talk about them a little deeper. Is that okay? Absolutely it is. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> They're like, sure. <laughs> I'm the one about response. Why? Because really, when you start responding, it gets in you. You know, it's like on Tuesday nights when I'm like, okay, and everybody's just sitting there. It's like, no, don't be nervous. Because I remember when I was in school, I'd be nervous when the teacher asked a question, points you out, and then you're like, but what if I don't know the answer? But what if you do? Yeah. What if you do? See, it's all in your expectation. And if you don't, then you get the answer. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Isn't that great? Yeah. I think so. And it's, it's when you can do it and laugh about it. And have fun with it. See, that's what a lot of people have gotten away from is really having fun with the Word of God. Because this is where we're supposed to learn daily, right? We're supposed to be transformed daily. But it's like, oh my goodness, there's so much in it. Oh, it's amazing. Because it's for what? Our good. It's for His glory, our good, right? Amen. I'm just, I'm just excited. I've been really meditating, and we've been talking about the kingdom of God. And that what we are now, when you get born again, you are now back in the original intent that God created you for. And if you don't know what it is, go back to Genesis. It tells you. It's very clear what we were created for. And I also talk about when Adam and Eve, that moment that the decision was made to eat of the fruit, you know, then it says their eyes were opened. And that word opened it meant their eyes, but it also meant their senses, their physical senses. So when we want to find out where our feelers came from, that's really where it came from. Because whenever they would walk in the cool of the day and they were in the presence of the Lord, that word presence means they were face to face with him. They got to see face to face. That's pretty amazing. That is amazing. Amazing, amazing, amazing. And the thing is, they had the opportunity. You go back and you look. What was the first thing that came when sin came? It was what? Shame. And it became a blame game. <laughs> I'm rhyming. <laughs> and, uh, and the thing is, you know, we've got to be careful with that too because we tend to want to blame others for what we're dealing with and what we're going through and decisions we make. And we have to start taking responsibility for who God created us to be. It's not anyone else's job but mine, correct? Once I get the information. I listened to someone the other day talking, you know, we need more preaching in the pulpit, not so much teaching. And I'm like, what? I was rolling. I, I was rolling because I'm like, if you can't teach it, you don't need to preach it. Right. I'm just, that's what I said. And it was like, it's interesting because what does teaching do? It gives you the information you need. And I love it. When you start studying, you get the information in you. Then all of a sudden, one day, you might get up, you're going through a situation, and you start pacing the house, start doing your walk, and what do you do? Next thing you know, you'll preach yourself real happy if you allow it. Because everything you've been taught comes back. It comes to the forefront. You know, we talk about here being a Bible training center, and, I, you know, we just can't let it go because it's who we are. So every day, every time we come together, some things we're going to hear over and over again. We talk about the repetition of it. You have to. Don't you get up every day and have a routine? It's a repetition, and if somebody messes with it, kind of, why don't, it throws your whole day off. But here's the thing, why can't we do that with the Word? Where we get in such a, what? 
repetition with the word every single day that when somebody or the enemy tries to throw us off, it, no, it should do something to us, right? We're going to start in, oh, there was so many places, so many places. Let's go to Hebrews 5. You know, we've been also talking, because on Tuesdays, you know, that gives us opportunity to where we have more of a, it's a classroom setting, but we also sit here and we've been talking about, you know, it should get to a place, the more you grow in Him, the thing, even some of the, even songs that we call Christian songs aren't going to be enough anymore. Because you're saying, I can't, I can't sing that anymore, that's not where I'm at. But oh, but that's an oldie but a goodie. It may be an oldie, but is it really the word you know we talk you know uh, we sit around and talk how a lot of people Pastor Danny I believe learn the word by song and I'm like that's good because I like music I do and I one of those see my feelers got in the way and I said oh that sounds so good that just tickles my fancy and here about two three weeks ago God really dealt with me on that he said, it's tickling your fancy, but is it changing you? And I thought, ooh, no, what it's doing, it's getting in my senses, my feelings, my emotions, and it's actually keeping me in that place right there. It's keeping me right there. But Lord, you know, you're going to set me free. No, you're already set free. That's right. Do you know that? Well, catch this. The Bible tells us very clearly that in the beginning we were given what? Dominion. Over what? The, the fish, the, everything but people. Right. Every creeping thing. So everything now that we are born again, just by your position alone, gets to come into authority. Under your authority. Did you know that? Isn't that what the Bible says? We get, immediately we're given a power of exousia, which is a seat of authority. But if you don't know that, you will begin to neglect it. And that's what's happened is people have not been taught. I was not taught about who I am truly in him. I got taught based on my emotion. I got, I got taught based on my hurts. And I was not taught based on dominion, based on authority and who I am. So in Hebrews 15, or uh, Hebrew, I apologize, five. I'm going to read out of the Amplified, but we're going to start for verse one. It says, For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in things relating to God, so that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. He's able to deal gently with the spiritually ignorant and misguided, since he is also subject to human weakness. And because of this human weakness, he is required to offer sacrifices for sins for himself as well as for the people. And besides one does not appropriate for himself the honor of being high priest, but he who is called by God, just as Aaron was, so too Christ did not glorify himself so as to be made a high priest, but he was exalted and appointed by what? By the one who said to him, you are my son. Today I have begotten you, meaning I've declared my authority and rule over the nations, just as he always says in another place, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his earthly life, Jesus offered up both specific petitions, urgent supplications for that which he needed with fervent cries, crying in tears to the one who was always able to save him from death. He was heard because of his reverent submission toward God, his sinlessness and his unfailing determination to do the Father's will. Although he was a son who had never been disobedient to the Father, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, uniquely equipped and prepared as Savior and retained his integrity amid opposition. He became the source of eternal salvation 
to all those who obey him. When it talks about this eternal salvation, that means an eternal inheritance. To all those who obey him, being designated by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Concerning this, we have so much to say, and it, it's hard to explain since you become dull and sluggish in your spiritual hearing and disinclined to listen. For though by this time you ought, be, you ought to be teachers because of the time you've had to learn these truths, you actually need someone to teach you again the elementary principles of God's word from the beginning. And you have come to be continually in need of milk and not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a spiritual infant. But solid food is for the spiritually mature whose what? Senses are trained. They're what? They're trained. We're talking the same senses. But now they're what? They're trained by practice to distinguish between what's morally good and what is evil. Well, what's interesting is about that when you look and you see where it talks about being trained, the senses, it's an organ of perception. And it's only here that it's talked about. It means to perceive, to understand. So isn't it interesting? So when people say, well, I can't control my feelings, I can't control these things, because you haven't what? train them. What are we supposed to do according to Hebrews 12? Well, let's go look real quick. So we're going to kind of bounce back and forth in the word. Is that okay? It says, verse 1, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with such a great cloud of witnesses, lay aside what? Every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. Let us run with patience the race that's set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, for who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds, which is your what? Your souls. You have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him, for whom the Lord loveth, he what? He chastises, he corrects. So here's the thing. We're talking about we have to train our senses, right? Right? And this is where so many people struggle because whenever somebody offends you, what do you do? You feel it first, right? And then you react on it. We were talking about this earlier. So I know I'm going through a place right now that I'm having to really check myself. Things that used to not bother me, they're bothering me now. And I'm like, you know what? I get to check myself. I can't be moved by my senses if it doesn't line up with the Word of God, correct? But I have to, what, train them. I have to teach them, well, how do you train yourself? Well, how do you train if you go for a marathon? You don't just start running right away, do you? No. You got to what? Research. Get the information. Correct? What do I need to do to get myself prepared? Well, maybe start by walking. <gasps> maybe start by eating right. Find out what you need to eat, what you don't need to eat, what foods will cause you to be sluggish, what foods cause you to have energy. Then I'm going to sit here and I'm going to start and I'm going to learn a pace. And I'm There's all this stuff you do to prepare, right? 
Because if you're out there and you and you see where people, especially with running and track and things like that, they're excited, but they have to discipline their mind to be patient. They have to discipline themselves because what do they want? I want to win, win, win. So they come out of the gate with everything they got. And then by the time they get to the end, a lot of them are struggling. And people have already bypassed them because they've learned to pace themselves. Come on, wake up. And this is where we get to sit here and we have to train ourselves. We can't just hit and miss things. We can't just hit a little bit here, hit a little bit of there, and think that we're going to pass the finish line as number one. We can't. So one thing we've been talking about with this is... Uh, talking about neglecting things. Oh, the joy of learning what we neglect and what we should and shouldn't neglect. Because some things we should. So in that, we were talking, and I've just got a lot of notes, so bear with me here. Um, I was talking to the Lord about neglect because there's a couple of places it talks about it, but go to Philippians 3. But I, while you're going there, and we'll start verse 1, I want to read this that the Lord gave me this morning about neglect. What is neglected begins to change. The state, the condition, the status, priority even changes. If you neglect a child, they begin to turn away to what? Other things. Because then a child wants to be nurtured, right? Right? So what? They, if you neglect them, they begin to turn to other things, other sources. Friends, videos, could be other family members. So they begin to turn away to other things to grow and nurture them. Hobbies. If you neglect a marriage... And I use this, and, I, and the Lord was talking about this. He goes, the house begins to suffer because the people begin to suffer. The state of the marriage will begin to change. If you neglect, we're talking neglecting the things of God in those areas. Neglect your soul. What begins to happen? Chaos, confusion, depression, anxiety begins to come in. People then begin to run to anything to find freedom from the things that they neglected. And now they're trying to push those things away, but they're doing it in desperation with the wrong things. Neglect a garden. Some plants die. Some just grow out of control. You have that plant that's just real resilient, and it just seems like all of a sudden there's nothing, then it's everywhere. Some, they can't grow to their best if, if even they grow at all. They lose their life. Some lose the very substance they were created to give us that God placed in them to reproduce or just die. See, we were given in the beginning dominion, a responsibility. When we accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, Guess what? I have that responsibility now. Doesn't the Bible say that all creation is waiting on what? The manifestation of the sons of God. Who is that? That's us. You see so many times where people have gone out and, and you see all these shows where they show where animals have been neglected and this and this. Animals can survive so long depending on what they were created for. But we were given the dominion. We were given the place of making sure everything stays in order. And we talked about this Tuesday. If you can be living in a house, but if you don't have life in you, that house will eventually begin to what? 
die. The building itself will. We were called to have life in us because Jesus is what? Life. And if he's in us, then what do we produce? We should produce what? Life. But if I'm neglecting myself, and we're going to look at this in Philippians in a minute, and if I'm neglecting myself, then what's going to begin to happen? That life's going to start what? Going to be contaminated, disappear. Everybody good? Okay. So here, and I'm, I'm going to talk about this, and I'm using the Amplify because, oh, all right. Verse 1, it's, and I'm using Amplified. It says, finally, my fellow believers, continue to rejoice and delight in the Lord. Who is he talking about? Should be everybody in this room, right? Everybody in here. We're believers, right? Jesus is our Lord and Savior. He said, to write the same things again is no trouble for me, and it's a safeguard for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the troublemakers. Look out for the false circumcisions. Circumcision. For we who are born again have been reborn from above, spiritually transformed. And I talked about this. When you look in a kingdom, where you're born is where your citizenship is, correct? Yes. We're born in America. Where's our citizenship? Here. It's documented here. But we got reborn into what? A kingdom. This kingdom that was established in the beginning. So now, where is my citizenship at? Heaven. Now, but God's placed me here. He said, now my throne's there. And the word throne, when we look at the throne of God, it is, it is like an overseeing. It's a canopy. And everything is under the seat of that throne. So if he's our king and he's given us dominion here, where do we look to find out how we're supposed to do this? He said, look, the orders come from me, but I've given you the responsibility. Right? I've given you the responsibility to lead your home. I've given you the responsibility to take, what? Not to neglect yourself, because if you neglect you, you can't really fully, with success, take care of anything else. So here he says, so we've been what? We've been reborn from above. Now we're transformed. That word transformed means what? Morphed. You can't see me. I can't see me like I used to be. That's what transformation does. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. It says, renewed, set apart for what? His purpose and our true circumcision who worship in the spirit of God and glory and take pride and exult in Christ Jesus place and place no confidence in what, in what we have or who we are in the flesh. Though I myself might have some grounds for confidence in the flesh if I were pursuing salvation by works. If anyone else thinks that he has a reason to be confident in the flesh, that is, in his own efforts to achieve salvation, I have far more circumcised when I was eight years old of the nation of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of Hebrews, an exemplary Hebrew, as to the observance of the law of Pharisee, as to my zeal for Jewish tradition, a persecutor of the church, and, and, and as to righteousness, suppose living, right living, which my fellow Jews believe is in the law, and prove myself blameless. But whatever former things were gained to me, as I thought then, these things once regarded as advancement in merit, I've come to consider as loss, absolutely worthless for the sake of Christ and the purpose which he has given my life. But more than that, I count everything as lost compared to the priceless privilege and supreme advantage of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, and of growing more deeply and thoroughly acquainted with him. For his sake, I've lost everything and I consider it all garbage. But the King James says, dung. It's just crap. There you go. <laughs> 
so that I may what? Gain Christ and I may be found in him believing and relying on him not having any righteousness of my own derived from my obedience to the law and its rituals but possessing that genuine righteousness which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness which comes from God by the basis of faith. And this so that I may know him experientially becoming more thoroughly acquainted with him, understanding the remarkable wonders of his person more completely, and in the same way experience the power of his resurrection, which overflows and is active in believers, that I may share the fellowship of his sufferings by being continually conformed, that means inwardly into his likeness, even to his death, dying as he did, so that I may attain what? The resurrection that will raise me from the dead. Isn't that what happened on the cross? When he went down, so did I. And when he came up, so did I. Man. Not that I have already obtained it, this goal of being Christ-like or having already been made perfect, but I actively press on so that I may take a hold of that perfection for which Christ took a hold of me and made me his own. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider that I've made it my own yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the heavenly prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. All of us who are maturing, that means pursuing spiritual perfection, should have this attitude. And if any respect, and if any respect you have a different attitude, then that too God will make clear to you. Only let us stay true to what we already have attained. Now that word forget, he said, I'm for what? Forget what's behind, forgetting what's behind me. That word forgetting, and we talked about this Tuesday, it means to neglect. And this is where I like when we get in day-to-day -day conversations because you get other people's thoughts and ideas about neglect. You know, Paul's sitting here, he goes, you know what? I forget about those things. I neglect them because if I don't, I can't go forward. I can't see what lays in front of me. But I did this and I did that. Well, guess what? Start neglecting it so you eventually forget about it. I, we were talking yesterday. There's certain things out there that, you know, um, I don't put my focus on because if I did I would begin neglecting the things of God over here when I should be neglecting the things of the world over here now there's some things yes I learn but I don't get caught up because if I do then what am I really doing I'm starting to neglect what's over here and he and Paul said look I, I, I'm forgetting those things I'm neglecting those things that means I'm not going to sit here and think about it. You want to talk about me? Go ahead. You want to say what you want about me? Go ahead. But I'm not going to focus on that because I don't know who you're talking about. And what God began to show me is years ago is whenever I sat there and I would go, Lord, why is it that there are so many things I don't remember? My parents would get mad. You don't remember this and you don't remember that. And I used it well when I got sick and I had my stroke and everything. That's why. That's why. And God one day said, no, that's not why. And I sat there. I was like, what? He said, you neglected those things because you turned your focus on me. Now you know what it means to, be, to really know to forget. Because, see, all my life it was always about neglect the good things and feed and focus on every bad thing. That's how I was raised. I mean, when you talked politics, you talked religion, anything in my home, it was so negative. And that was the focus. That was the focus. And then as I got older, people go, man, you're so negative. You're just mean. Well, because what did I didn't neglect those things. I what? I embraced those things. See, what you embrace, what you water, what you feed, what you give in, that's what you become. So when I sat there and I found the Lord, no one was there to help me walk things out, really. they just give me a scripture and say, go read that. And I'm like, but what does it mean? I don't get it. So when I finally got my first revelation, I'm like, I like revelation. 
that is a pretty cool thing. I want more. And it was a parable of the sower. And when I started getting revelation of that, I didn't let it go. I didn't get revelation of other things right away. But I did start getting revelation of that. Now, did I get there overnight? No. But I did find over time, I stopped thinking so much about the other stuff that they go, oh, remember a couple years ago? No. Did it have anything to do with kingdom? See, because... <laughs> Some people agree, some don't. But when you focus so much on the Word, you begin to live, breathe, talk the Word. And the things of the world just don't stick. Don't, you know, don't matter. And I found for me, that's what I have to do. Because I don't want to, I don't need to remember that. I'm one of those, for me, I'm one of those that it's like, okay, all right, it's done, came, saw, did it, okay, let's go on, next. And I have learned to live in the moments. For years, death was a big thing for me. I was so afraid to die. But yet, that's all I was around was violence and the decisions I made. But I was so afraid to die. Then when I found out, wait a minute, I got born again and I'm what? I'm never going to die? Really? I'm never going to die? Really? All of a sudden, that fear was gone because I took my mind off of the worldly idea of death because I found out I'm not going to die. I'm not dying. Hello, catch this. I'm not dying. I'm not dying. Ever. And I'll keep saying it, ever. What about our bodies? I'm going to have a glorified body. I'm not dying. My body's going to shift a little, change a little, but I'm not dying. So I stop and I think about those that, okay, they've, they, they've passed, and it's like, ho, oh, oh, ho, you ain't dead either. And I'm not either. I'm forever going to live. So now that's not an issue like it was before I found him. That was a fear that followed me everywhere I went, and I would end up in situations that I thank the Lord every day I didn't. But then once I gave my life to him, I had to what? Stop looking. And what did I do? And I've shared this, and, and I'm going to keep sharing it. I had to cut off those that wanted to keep me there. I had to cut them off. It wasn't forever. It was for a time, a season. And it was because of I wanted to live. I was miserable. I was miserable. And then I find Jesus, and I still don't know what all I'm doing. And I'm like, man, all right, Lord, I found you. Now what? Well, let's go to Matthew 6. And I'm just going to touch on things that we've, we've uh, covered before. But sometimes we need to be reminded, don't we? And I don't care how many times I read it, how many times I see it, I get to go back and remind myself what this means. Let's start at verse 22. And I'm going to do this for sake of time. It says, The light of the body is the eye. If therefore in that eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. Well, what does that tell you? If your eyes what? <coughs> one vision. If you have one vision. Right? What is my vision? Him. Is it not? My vision is him. That's where my focus should be. So what? I should neglect anything else because what does it say after that? It says, but if your eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is thy darkness? Well, wait a minute. Light and darkness aren't the same. 
But people will take the darkness and they will try to what? Shine a light and illuminate it. Yes? Well, what do you mean? Your problem is not bigger than Jesus. Your problem is not bigger than you. When you have Jesus, you're bigger than your problem. Right? God has given us everything that we need to deal with our problems. We just have to sit there and what? We have to stand and face those things. And that we talk about this in new way. It's not always easy. But the thing is, in the body, if we're one body, right? We're all members. Yes. But we're one body. So that means if, if I'm a finger, I'm connected to something. So if my finger's got a pain, I'm going to go to my hand. See, you're not alone. And I use stuff like this because people sit there and go, yeah, but I'm out there all by myself. No, you're not. Not unless you choose to be. You're connected to something. It's like a baby toe. You're a baby toe. Hey, you got a big responsibility, but nobody sees me. It doesn't matter. You're keeping the body right. Toes are important. If you want to be fair, barefooted, go ahead. But I'm just telling you, it doesn't matter. You've got to be connected. That's, that's huge. We talked about this yesterday. Then he goes on and it says that no man can serve two masters. You can't serve light and darkness. For either he will hate one and love the other, or else he will hold to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now here's the key with this. It says no man can serve two masters. You can't serve two masters. But when you come to know Jesus, you've got to learn how to serve, so you've got to be taught. We talked about this yesterday. Sometimes people do come to know the Lord, and I had to learn this. People come to know the Lord, but some aren't taught what to do after. Some aren't here long enough to do the next part of it. But the thing is, that's what we do here, right? We're a Bible training center teaching who we are in Christ by what? Basing all things and what? Develop believers in their gifts and callings. Not my gifts and callings, in their gifts and callings. Because see, when you help someone develop in their gifts and callings, you're developing yours too even more. I love that because I'm always growing, I'm always learning. Always. Always, always, always. So I can't serve two masters, but until somebody is willing, first off, to teach me, hello, we are. Hello, we are. And it does, it's not always going to feel good. There's growing pains, growing pains. But the thing is, it's for what? It's because of the life that's already in you. Now we get to help you what? Find that life and learn how to walk in the freedom of it. See, darkness says, no, you're in bondage. Light says, no, you're in freedom because now you see everything. So now that you see everything that's there, now you get to walk your walk. Can't walk it like you did before. Now you get to walk a new way. Just like you, when a baby's born, they don't walk right away. They don't even crawl right away. What? They come in... And they're given what? They're given formula or milk. They're given what they need to begin to build them and build them and build them. But whose responsibility is it to give them what they need? Parents. Ours. So if you neglect those things, they're not going to get the fullness of what they need. And the Bible says we are accountable to that. It, it does. So he says, you can't serve two masters. And a lot of people go, well, now you're born again. You can't serve the other master. We'll teach him how. Right. Te teach him how. And then he goes on and, lo and he says, you either hate one or love the other or else he will hold to one and despise the other. When I got born again and I started doing what I knew was right, I had to, what, not neglect my new place, my new position. I had to begin to stay there and neglect over there. And then one day, it seemed like a day, but it really wasn't because I chose not to neglect this and I chose to neglect that. One day, I just didn't want it anymore. I didn't miss it. 
Now, was it still a battle within? Of course. Remember, I'm dealing with senses. I got to train my senses. That means I get to tell my senses what they're going to do. So I've learned when I'm emotional, don't do nothing. Don't do nothing in my emotion because I will mess it up. Do I still have moments? Of course. But then I get to what? I get to recognize it and what I do. Now I got to work on this. So who's, who? I get to train me. And then if I don't know what to do to train me in this, I go find somebody that does. Isn't that what we are, Bible Training Center? Training, right? And some don't want to be trained. They think they've already got it. You'll never have it. You'll never arrive. If you think you have, you're deceiving yourself. And the Bible talks about that because we've been talking about being in unbalanced and how some are so many are so unbalanced. And a false balance is an abomination to the Lord. It truly is. And if I get there, I get there. If not, I will. It may be Tuesday. Because it's important that we understand balance, right balance. The other day we were in their office and I was looking for the, sc the scales and I was like, they're like, oh, there. And I'm like, yeah. Because it's huge. It's important. It really is. But I got to stay focused. Got to stay on track. <laughs> oh. Then he goes on, verse 25. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink, nor, nor yet for your body what you will put on. Is not, life more, is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather in barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much more better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit into your stature? And why take you thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They don't toil, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? Oh, ye of what? Now that's a tough one. Oh, ye of little faith. You know, that hit me when I first heard that, when I read this, because I'm thinking, first off, when you finally get excited about the things of God, then all of a sudden it's like, I don't got to worry for nothing. I don't, and I don't, as long as I steward what I have. Right. So that's where I messed up. <laughs> I thought, well, I can go out and do whatever I want. God said, he's got me. I will not lack for food. I will not lack for clothes. I won't lack for anything. Well, if you don't steward it correctly, yeah, you'll be lacking a lot. Mm -hmm. And then people want to blame God, and it's like, you can't blame him. He said, you've got to trust him. Well, he didn't say just trust him there. Right? You've got to trust him what? In everything. Even when your senses, your feelers don't want to. Guess what? You get to train them up some more. You realize when you're dealing, yes, Lord, you're dealing with sen your senses, it's like dealing with the child. And what does the Bible say about train up your child in the way they should go? When they get old, they won't depart. Your spirit is perfect. Now you're training your what? Your soul. So the more you what? Don't neglect those things. Train them up. Then all of a sudden you'll find you'll be in a situation that a year ago would have just, you felt like destroyed you. But now, <laughs> really? And you'll find your emotions aren't there like they were. Why? Because you have put into you what you have needed And developed yourself, and you just probably don't know it. And it, when you do know it, is when something happens. We were talking about this earlier. You know, I, you see somebody. I, I, I was telling Dee. I remember when I first met her till now, and I'm like, man, she's she's different. She's her. You know, when she has to, she will. And I'm sitting here, and I look at people, and I see where they're growing and they're developing. And I'm having to learn the patience with them because, see, I didn't have people patient with me because I had to learn a lot 
just really on my own. And then when I come into a body of believers that I can sit down with now and go, ooh, now my growth's fixing to really take off. See, some people don't want to admit they still got to grow. They think, oh, no. No, I need the body to help me grow. I need the body to sit here and continue to help me out. That's what I love about it. So verse 31, it says, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall you eat, or what you drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. So there's nothing in your life he doesn't have, know that you have need of, right? Some things it's not a need, it's a want. But he knows you don't need it. He says, I know what you have need of. Does he not? And, and, and today that's not a need. He might not feel that this is a need. He might actually feel like, no, you need to quit being needy and let it go. See, God wants to build us and strengthen us. The things that we need to let go of is the things that are keeping us back and keeping us down, keeping us miserable, keeping us in a bondage. And when God stretches us and God sits there and, and he wants us to walk literally by faith and not by sight, it's going to stretch every part of you. It has to, or you can't grow. And I don't like it. It hurts. But it's needed and it's necessary. And that's what I look at. I neglect the pain of it and focus on the purpose of it. Come on now, come on. Take your physical body. You're in pain, okay? You deal with pain. All right, but what are you focused on? Are you focused on the pain? Or are you focused on what the Word says because a purpose in your life needs to be fulfilled? It's got to be the Word. Because that word, one day you'll wake up, and I've told my testimony, I've heard other people's testimony, one day you'll wake up and you won't even realize you've gotten past that because the word took over. You neglected, now hear me out, you neglected acknowledging, not saying you didn't say it wasn't there, but you're not going to feed into it because that's what happens. You begin to feed into this, feed into this, and neglect the word, and the word is the what? That's the life. We came from a place of wholeness now, correct? And if, we can, and if we sit here and we preach it, we confess it, we say it, then the only way that you're going to prove it is by living it and demonstrating it. There's days that I know what I deal with, but I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to look back to the Word because of what God has done in my life, what I have seen Him do, the miracles, the signs, the wonders. But here's the beautiful thing about a miracle, and I've talked about it once. I'll still say it. It's a moment in time, but the blessings always. So I'm going to choose to say, okay, that was my miracle so I can walk out the blessing and the purpose. So there's still days that, yeah, I know what my body does, but I'm going to sit here and go, I know when to rest because there's times, yes, we have to rest. We can push ourselves. But then there's times you just got to push through. You really do. I know I've had to. I've watched those that have done that. And it's like, you know what? If the Bible says that I have dominion over every living thing, that flies, swims, creeps, creeping, then I have dominion over everything except people. So I get to what? I've got to walk that out. I've got to demonstrate. Aren't we to be examples to people out there? Of course we are. Of course we are. That's why, you know, whenever Dee Dee was, uh, when doing the community gathering of love and doing testimonies, people ha just have lost sight of why they have a testimony. Tell us your testimony because there's more freedom in it for you, too. But it's also for someone else. That's why I'll brag about God every day. I've had people, I've given my testimony here just a couple weeks about what God did in finances. Huge. And I've had more people try to come to bunk it and say, oh, no. Let me tell you what happened. And I have to look them square in the face say, no, it didn't, and I can prove it. See, that's the thing about it. I can, but I'm not going to. I don't need to. I'm not going to justify what God did. 
I'm not. We know. I have my witnesses that have walked this out with me for the last six years. I think six or seven. I've had that. So it's like I make sure my, I have my witnesses. I have everything I need. Because for what? His glory. I don't have to prove anything to people about. But it was interesting. This testimony here, I've had a lot of testimonies. And this one is one people have had more struggles with. And I'm like, are you jealous? Are you jealous? You don't know what I had to do to get through it. You don't know how I had to face myself in it and my errors. And I had to face pride and I had to face ego and I had to face lack of knowledge and I had to think, oh, I got all this, oh, Lord. And also false teachings that I had to unlearn. in this particular area. See, people think it's just, bam. No, I had to neglect some things. And it took time. But then I had to focus back and say, this is what I'm going to do. I've been given my instruction. I wrote my instruction down. Then if I couldn't remember it, I went back and said, hey, i gotta, I got to ask you a question again. i got to go back. Now, what were you saying about this and this? I want to make sure I understood it because I, I, I think I, I forgot that. And I tell you what, it's important that we understand that. So verse 33 says what? But seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and what? All these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow will take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Well, doesn't God say that he knows what you have need of? He knows you need all these things. But when you seek what? First seek the kingdom of God and his what? Righteousness. His righteousness. Not mine. Not yours. So when we look at the word righteous, when it talks about righteousness, it's what? It's a judicial verdict. But it's a verdict of approval. It's divine approval. Because, see, not everybody walks in righteousness. But when I walk in righteousness and I do it his way, then I get what? His divine approval because I'm proving it. I've proven my case. He says, oh, you know how we hear you? God will, God will give you more when he can trust you in it. Well, I've been approved. First seek what? The kingdom dominion, his dominion, his authority, his rule, what he has set in place, and his divine approval, his righteousness, which I have to prove in my life by doing what he says. He is not going to give me something if I will not take care of it. Why would he do that? Why would he give me something that is so precious to him if I can't take care of it? It's when I focus, showing, proving. And what does the Bible say? Study what? <laughs> Rightly dividing the word of truth. Who be not what? Who be not ashamed. Rightly dividing truth. Rightly dividing truth. And that again takes what? Focus neglect but I've been taught this and I've been taught this and I th if it doesn't line up and that's why we were talking about this a lot of people go to the dictionary Merriam's Webster's dictionary and they look at those definitions some are correct but some are not the word forgetting what do you automatically think well just forget it no when you study that in the Word, it says you've got to neglect it. So that means you've got action that has to go with this. You literally are going to have to put you under subjection. Oh, that's fun. woo -hoo. You're going to have to put your ideas under subjection. You're going to have to put everything that you know, what? Under subjection and neglect anything that does not belong to Him. Anything that is not about Him. Anything that you have been taught incorrectly. You've got to learn to neglect it because you won't forget it until you do. Because what happens over time when you neglect something, you eventually forget about it. 
And Paul talked about that. Well, then how come he said this, this, and this? He said, well, because people were going to say it. And he's like, you can say what you want. It's not who I am now because I neglected it. See, Paul was a very educated man. He knew how he grew up. He knew what he grew up in. He knew, he said, oh, you test me on, I mean, you could test Paul on these things. But he said, but I don't want to because I don't need to because it's dumb. It's mess. This is my focus now. Now, you want to talk this stuff? So sometimes how do you neglect something by not talking about it with your people? Not talking about it with, well, they've been my BFF for 30 years. Well, if they're not sitting here talking about the things of God, but yet you want to grow in those things, then you got to start neglecting some convert. And I see people do this. Oh, I just can't. I can't. One of the hardest things that for me personally was when I did come, I didn't have friends growing up. So that wasn't the big thing. When I got born again, I started in ministry and I started meeting people. Then I thought, oh, like-minded believers. Yes. So then what do you do at that moment? Then you're sitting there going, oh, yeah. Oh, that's good. And then all of a sudden you're becoming what? Like-minded. That doesn't mean it's the right mind, but it's like-minded. <laughs> so then you're sitting there and you're excited because now I found a family. Now I have found those that I can, I can trust in and I can be friends with. Woo! that's awesome and then God says now we're going to move you well what no I, I'm comfortable here not realizing some things and I'm like no come on he says no I got a purpose for you and this is what we're going to do if you'll do it see it's up to me so I did that not realizing what was about to go down in the process when I came back here it seemed like everything went phew. I mean, it did. Where I had had so much order. And my, I mean, I could get up in the morning. I knew what I was doing from the time I got up to the time I went to bed. Did this for years. Even ministry. Knew exactly. I come here and I felt like my whole world just got shaken. Because it did. It had to. I didn't understand it. But I knew what God, the purpose God sent me to do. He said, this is what we're going to do. And I said, okay. And we were talking about this yesterday, about Tuesday nights. Okay, that was opportunity to start a Bible study when I came back. Okay. I was excited. I love ministry. I'm excited. I'm pumped. Yeah. Well, when you do pursue the things of the Lord, you've got to be prepared what's going to come with it. Because anything that is in you that's not correct must be dealt with for success. So in that, I found out there's a whole lot of stuff. But what was awesome is there also came a, lot, a day where a decision had to be made. And God kind of helped me do that because I don't know if I'd have done it on my own. I really don't. I mean, I'm honest about that. But a, but a way was made. And by the time it was all over and done with, bam, I'm here today. But it wasn't easy. It was hard. It was tough. Had people I loved dearly. I do, and I still do. But now where I'm at, it's different. <clears throat> because it had to come to a point. And, and, and Farron says this in a new way. He's, and, and I love when he said this. I'll walk with you as long as you continue walking. But when you stop, I'm going to keep going. And it's hard when you walk with somebody. And not just one or two, but you walk with many. And they stop and you keep going. Because then you go through a grieving period. You go through anger. You, you go through all that. Well, aren't those part of your senses, your feelings? Of course it is. So guess what? I had to deal with that too. But man, now... It's like, God, what are you doing now? Because I, I, I got through that, and then here we go. And then we've talked about ever since we've got married, God had me sit down one day and literally write out everything he had done 
from the day we got married, all the, all the blessings because of obedience. Things that God has done in his life. This, I mean, our life now, because it's kind of like we were talking about this the other day. We see where now God has literally, how do I say, everything that I brought to the table when we got married is no longer there. It got dealt with because I went and sought help. Things that I brought to the table, and you could call it baggage, whatever you want, but now it's not there. Things that, that he brought, God has done some supernatural things to get those things, what, out of the way. Are we still growing? Are we st Of course. Absolutely. But I love how God does things because you may not see it as it's happening, but then one day, bam, there it is. Oh, that's what that was. But it's because I had to neglect other things but I had to turn around and refocus on things I had been neglecting that I shouldn't have been. See, and that's where sometimes we got to find that fine line. And I'm glad I have help to do that. You know, it's important. So when he says, but first seek you the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things that should be added to you. Everybody goes, well, I'm going to run to the word and I'm going to seek it. Yes, but guess what? Sometimes I get to run to somebody. Because I'm still seeking kingdom. As long as I'm what? Talking to the ones that are in what? Kingdom. See, we can be so spiritual that we are literally robbing ourselves of moving forward. Come on. We are robbing ourselves of moving forward. And what the purpose God has. That's why we're all here together. We're all sitting here and, and everybody's like, but I want the blessing and I want this and I want that. I'm telling you, you do this, you will. You'll be walking in it. Every day I have an opportunity to glorify him. Oh, I want to be the blessing. Why am I always expecting him to bless me? Why don't I do bless him? Why don't I walk this out? Because I am the blessing. Yes, I am. And on top of that, I am blessed. Everybody good? And some things you got to sit there and you can need to go home and chew on for yourself. You really do. And he says, take therefore no thought for tomorrow, for tomorrow shall take thought for itself. You know what? I got tired of thinking about tomorrow because it gave me a headache. It gave me a stomach ache. I got ulcers and everything else. And when I heard that I'm not supposed to, I'm like, ooh, what do I got to do? You got to work on it. Work on it. So real quick, and then I'm going to close. We're going to go to 1 Peter 2. And we quote this, and we quote this, and we quote this. And I'll start with verse 1. It says, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and all hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings. These are five things we have to do to grow. we got to lay these things aside. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, you've got to desire the milk first. You can't jump into the meat. Take the milk. Admit where you're at and say, look, I'm on milk but desire not to stay there. Because what does milk do? It just strengthens the body. It strengthens the bone. It gives you your nutrients, but then eventually you should what? Graduate into the meat. And we know we got a lot of meat people in here. They're like, yeah, meat. It says, if so, be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. To whom coming, as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also as living stones. 
So we have a chief cornerstone, which is what? Jesus. But then we're also, what did he say here? You're also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore who believes he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. <laughs> that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now we look at the scripture, but you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. And we tell people we are different, right? We're an island of misfit toys, right? Mm -hmm. And that's pretty cool. It really is. I'd rather be different than to be lost in a crowd because everybody's the same. I'm just saying. So we sit here and we look at this word generation and it means country, a nation. It means offspring. You're a chosen generation. So we've been chosen, right? We're chosen what? Country, nation, offspring. We're chosen. Hello. And then it says a royal priesthood. That word royal means kingly in nature. You mean when I get born again, I'm what? My nature is now what? Kingly. Do you see yourself like that? Do you study to show yourself that? That's who you are. A holy nation. That word holy is what? Sacred, blameless. Nation, a race of the same habit, a tribe. Mm-hmm. Mm -mm -mm. a peculiar people we know what peculiar is because that's who we are the word people here means characteristically God's chosen people that's what it means right there mm. people have to understand if you do not go back to the word and see who you are, you will not operate in it because you're neglecting to go back and see who you are. Sometimes, now hear me out, sometimes we want to go back and we want to look for healing and we want to look for finances and all that. Find out who you are first because you really properly can't operate in it if you don't know who you are. Because when I know who I am, it automatically happens. Now, this goes back to my point when I gave my testimony about finances. I'm sitting there going, I know who I am. I know who I am. I, I knew part of who I was. But I knew enough about who I am to know I need help. And when I found out I didn't have to strive and work for things, just be obedient to what the Word said and who I am, everything falls in place. Everything falls in place. Again, if we try to strive, and, and we hear this so many times, even in New Way, people are like, well, I tried this and I tried that, and I, it didn't work, so I guess I, I need to do something different. Yes, you do. Find out who you are and do it. Meditate on it. Chew on it. And say, this is who I am. That means everything that belongs to the king belongs to me. Whoa, what? Absolutely. But you got to learn who you are. You got to learn who you are. So when we quote this, we're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth what? The praises of him who hath called out you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are nasty. It's talking about kingly people. You weren't at one point because of where you were. 
But now, uh, which in time past you were not a people. People miss that. I'm, I am. I'm part of. No, you're not. Not if you're not. Not if you don't know who you are, according to the word. Now, if you've accepted Jesus, yes. Let's get going. Let's be taught. But we're talking about people who don't know Jesus. We're talking about people who want to sit here and people that they go, well, I mean, I know God. You've got to know Jesus to get to God. You've got to. So which in time past were not a people, but are now. See, now. So we're now what? We're now the people. See, if you'll notice when you're dealing with... <laughs> Outside of God, it's a people. But now we're what? The people. That's an ownership. That's a, that's a confidence. How many of y'all remember grow, growing up and you're in high school, I'm the man or I'm the one? That word the was huge, wasn't it? <laughs> My husband's pointing at himself. <laughs> How'd that work out for you? You had to fight. You had to fight a lot. See, that's what the world does. They want to fight. Look at me. I'm fighting for status. I'm fighting for position. I'm fighting for what's mine. You know what? God says he fights my battles for me. I have one fight to fight. And that's a good fight of faith. That's the only fight I've got to fight. But I got to what? Find out who I am. Right? But see, the world likes to fight. They like to... Mm, it's all about that. It says, which had not obtained mercy, but now what? Because now we, the people, we've obtained what? Mercy. We've obtained. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain. Abstain from fleshly lust, which war against what? The soul. Remember, you are called to train your senses, which is your soul. Here, then it says, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles. What does that word conversation also mean? Citizenship. Because what you say declares who you are. Right? If I say, if I say that I'm a believer... If I say, then shouldn't my life reflect that? Because where am I declaring my citizenship? By my conversation. He says, let it be honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Do you see how important you are? You really are. Every one of you that believes that Jesus is your personal Lord and Savior, you're in now. You're in kingdom now. Now you've got to find out what that kingdom consists of. Now you have to sit here and you've got to find out, you mean I'm that valuable? Absolutely. You're more valuable than you know. See, this is where people have told you you have no value. You're not worthy, but you are because you accepted Jesus. Now you've got the king himself. And your desire is the kingly desires he's placed on the inside of you. And watch what he'll do as you continue to seek and go forth. Watch what he'll do. But we have to neglect ourselves too. We have to neglect the things in us that don't need to, what? Be nurtured anymore. Right? And that's going to cause us to what? Woo, sometimes. But it's worth it. It's worth it. Mm. So we're going to stop there. I said, we'll, we'll continue this on Tuesday. But it's important that we understand about these things. Just because, and look, if the world threw you away, clap. Be joyous. Be happy. Please. Because God didn't throw you away. God says, no. Now you're mine. Amen? Amen. Father, we just thank you, Lord. Oh, Father, I just thank you. You have set us up.
We have been set up, Father, to walk in the fullness as sons, daughters, and that, Lord, you have opened everything, made available to us, everything that we need. Thank you. Holy Spirit, just continue bringing that revelation, ministering, comforting in these places of growth. Thank you, Jesus, that you were that door, that access that got us to the Father. <sighs> mm. Lord, bless everybody in this room. I ask you to bless everyone in here, Father. And as they're pushing through these places, dealing with these things regarding the soul that they feel the Holy Spirit is the comforter, but not to stay there to move forward, knowing they have family, knowing that we're in this as one, not to look at ourselves as individuals only, but also one in him. Mm. We love you and thank you. Amen.